Thank you for your kind introduction. This feeling of dread. I'm going to tell a story. <laughs> We get to do linguistics. Oh, my students are trained. <laughs> okay, so orientation. Uh, I'm a professor of linguistics. Linguistics is one of the lesser known fields of study. If you're going to take a course in history or chemistry, you probably pretty much know what the plot is and what's going to be discussed. Linguistics, not so much. I have known people who have taken my class because it fulfilled an arts and humanities requirement who didn't even know what linguistics were. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm going to do a fairly brief introduction to define some terms and to set some parameters and introduce some themes. Then there are two middle sections and then a conclusion which will probably be mercifully brief. <laughs> okay, here we go. Language. Language is a system of communication, human communication, involving speech or sometimes gesture. We limit our study of language to that in the linguistics classroom because even though there are other kinds of communication that are very important, if anybody tells you that body language is not important, they haven't been paying attention, but you will. <laughs> so we don't deal with that. That's for the communications colleagues to, to take care of. We study the system of language and how it works. Language is rule governed behavior. The rules are subsumed under the notorious G word, <laughs> about which I'll talk more. Grammar is really pretty cool when you're a linguist. Uh, language is very nearly universal for humans. As the noted linguist Steven Pinker has said, babies are born with the instinct to speak the way spiders are born with the instinct to spin webs. You don't need to train babies to speak, they just do. Any normal baby in normal circumstance will learn to speak as many languages as the baby is exposed to on a consistent basis. This is wonderful. This is one of our few instincts beyond sheer survival. Um, there are different languages in the world, as you know, and we study those differences and we delight in the differences, but human language has a great deal in common such that if there were a space alien linguist who would come to our world and take a look at the languages that we speak, the space alien linguist would conclude correctly that all of us are speaking a dialect of Earth ease. <laughs> <laughs> Shameless plug for the wonderful film, Arrival. Yes. I love that film. There was an alien invasion, and the powers that be had the good sense to send in a linguist. <laughs> Not somebody with things to blow everybody up. See if you can. But you see how different the language is. There's just no, no continuity there. Um, if you are exposed to a language enough and you're a human, you can learn that language if you believe that you can. This um, took the linguist who had superpowers as a linguist <laughs> quite a while to do. Okay, so linguistics is the study of the phenomenon of language. It is not necessarily the study of any particular language, though it can be. You could specialize in a particular language without necessarily even being all that good at speaking it. I've seen it done. <laughs> when we talk about our knowledge of language, every one of you 
has complete, perfect knowledge of your language. Complete, perfect knowledge of your idiolect. The thing is that this knowledge is procedural rather than declarative. Procedural knowledge is when you know how to do something, you just can. not Declarative knowledge is how you can explain how it works, what it's doing. I have the students in my intro to linguistics class put their hands like this and explain to each other how to tie their shoes. <laughs> it usually does not go well. <laughs> By the same token, I can use a microwave. I have no idea how they work. And I don't care. <laughs> um, I can take flour and sharpening and water and salt and fruit and sugar and spices and produce a pie procedurally. I don't know much of anything about the chemistry of what happens with these ingredients and heat and so forth. It would be nice if I did it, but that's not what I study all day. Um, okay. This brings us to the idea of a linguist. When you see a job um, announcement for a linguist, where these announcements appear, usually what they're after is somebody who has facility in a number of languages. If the FBI wants a linguist, it's somebody to go in and speak the language that is needed. Uh, same with other governmental entities and others. When linguists talk about that, that's not what we mean. We mean somebody who's fascinated by the phenomenon of language and wants to make that the object of intense study. Here is an important disclaimer. This afternoon, I am speaking as a linguist, not as a maker of political statements, or an advocate for any particular course of action or inaction. I'm going to be describing how language can be used for certain rhetorical purposes to reveal information, to hide information, to put a spin on information, to be persuasive in, um, in political action or whatever. If you think I'm getting political, I'm not. Ah, oh, grammar. <laughs> what feeling does grammar arouse in you? Warm and happy? <laughs> For some of us, yes. For others, there's this constriction and the, uh, yeah. Linguists talk about three kinds of grammar. Prescriptive grammar, descriptive grammar, and teaching grammar. The kind of grammar that you, as mostly English-speaking people, little children, study when you were in K through 12, was prescriptive grammar. Prescriptive looks like prescription. <coughs> it fixes what's wrong with the way you talk. So you sound like you're speaking the prestige dialect. Maybe that. <laughs> um, linguists are much more interested in descriptive grammar which just describes what has to happen if language is going to take place. You have to utter sounds in a certain way. You have to put words together in a certain way. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. And that's what we're interested in. Would you think we might be interested in varieties of language that have different ways of expressing things? My good. <laughs> Double modal. <laughs> term in linguistics, creativity. When we use that term in everyday life, when we're not talking about linguistics, we tend to mean the ability that people have to write beautiful poetry, to design wonderful buildings, to compose glorious music, or to make amazing things out of empty oatmeal boxes, dried pasta, <laughs> paint, glue, and glitter. <laughs> This is not what we mean when we talk about creativity in linguistics. <coughs> Instead, it is the fact that for speech, we have a smallish, varies from language to language, pool of speech sounds. Not all languages use all speech sounds 
that would be that. So we have our set of speech sounds. Linguists, you can do this along with me. They are put together into a much larger but still finite set of words. And those words can be put together into an infinite variety of phrases and sentences, most of which have never been uttered before. <coughs> Every time we talk, it is a new creation. Even if we're just saying hello, it'll be a little bit different from the last time we said hello. <laughs> and these differences are noticeable and can be important. So um, we can be the image of the creator in this way. In fact, we are. I can say something that you have never heard before and create something in your mind. The three kangaroos in the lobby just set fire to one of the sofas. They're using the fire to roast marshmallows and trying to feed them to the alligators. But the alligators prefer kale. <laughs> no one has ever said this before. <laughs> because why would they? <laughs> I am using this as a, an indicator that we create all the time. We bring something out of nothing all of the time. Um, George Lakoff, another linguist, is famous for his book, Don't Think of an Elephant. When I said, don't think of an elephant, what just happened? <laughs> OK, end of the beginning. Language matters. People often say words matter. That is true, but that is not what this talk is about. I'm going to talk about language which involves words, but a lot more. Attempts to save endangered language often involve exhaustive lists of words, which is a good start and much, much, much better than nothing. But imagine if the music of Johann Sebastian Bach or John Lennon were about to be lost forever. Even a well-organized list of all of the notes and chords they used would be of extremely limited value. So I'm going to show you <coughs> what can be different about the same words with an exercise that I like to call situation <laughs> I will need uh, I will need a brave volunteer to read. Brave volunteer. <laughs> Dear John, I want a man who knows what love is all about. You are generous, kind, thoughtful. People who are not like you admit to being useless and inferior. You have ruined me for other men. I yearn for you. I have no feelings whatsoever when we are apart. I can be forever happy. Will you let me be yours? Gloria. Thank you. Well, well, I need another brave volunteer to read another letter. All right. Thank you. Dear John, I want a man who knows that love is. All about you are generous, kind, thoughtful people who are not like you. Admit to being useless and inferior. You have ruined me. For other men, I yearn. For you, I have no feelings whatsoever. When we are apart, I can be forever happy. Will you let me be? <laughs> Yours, Lord. <laughs> On the typo. <laughs> They're always going to get in there. But you see what just happened? Meaning is not composed by the words or even the word order. Meaning has to do with hierarchical structure, what belongs with what, what phrases go with what. And until you know how that language is organized, you can only make guesses about the underlying meaning. Now, um, what that has as uh, relevance for life and thought in general is that back in the day, people did not use punctuation at all. 
And it was fairly recently that they decided to put spaces between written words. So if you are going to interpret something that is a written text, an ancient text, you've got to be good. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to have all kinds of corroborating evidence about what the text actually says and uh, can be interpreted as. Okay, where are we? Um, people who are not linguists know things about language that aren't factually true. That is okay, up to a point. I, for example, will never forget, I will never forget a faculty retreat. <laughs> <laughs> that most of the faculty either did not know or did not believe Newton's third law. It was amazing. The physicists humbled us, and pride exists only to be annihilated. <laughs> um, what are the things that people know about language that, that's eh, not so much. Um, Eskimos have many words for snow. <laughs> uh -uh. This was actually perpetrated by a linguist, Franz Boas, who spent some time with people around the Arctic Circle and concluded, not quite correctly, that since he could pick out 50 words, that this is how it was. What he didn't realize was about polysynthetic languages, where you go straight from morphemes, which are minimal units of meaning, into full sentences. You skip the word level. So if I say in English, we went moose hunting, it takes me four words to say that. It does not take four words to say that in Chukchi or many of these other languages. So what's another thing? Oh, yes. When I talked about grammar with introductory uh, linguistics class, and this is something that is held true over 29 years. I've taught the course at least twice a year, usually three times, and only twice in all of those times when I've asked, do you remember a rule of grammar? Has it not happened that the rule of grammar that they remember first is except <laughs> after C. I find this hilarious. <laughs> Endearing, but hilarious. Because it's a spelling rule. Yes. Doesn't even work. People also think that when you when you talk, there are pauses between words. No. No. Here's an experiment. How many words are in this sentence? How many words are in this sentence? Seven. You sure? Of course you're sure. Okay, now let's try this. Same question. Quante parole ci sono in questa frase? Seven.
it, it's more like basketball than anything else. We just look at it. Sometimes it's like rugby. <laughs> um, meaning in language is created by the words we use. This is true to an extent, but not to a complete extent. So we can think, if we have all of the right words, we're all set. Here is a test of that. Think of the word perfect. What does it mean? Without flaw, right? Think of the word good. What does it mean? It doesn't mean not bad. It's not bad, it's not good. Good, exactly as it should be. Okay. Watch what happens when I put them into a phrase. Perfectly good. What do you mean you want a new bicycle? The one you have is perfectly good. <laughs> so the meaning of perfectly good is probably more like marginally adequate. <laughs> okay, where are we? Okay, and word meaning is stable. So that over the eight years and over the centuries, you can be sure that this means this, and it always will. I won't even go into how wrong that is. <laughs> It's just wrong. <laughs> so instead, uh, as we go further into this, I'm going to give you three more te technical terms. Uh, morphine is a technical term meaning a minimal unit of meaning. If I say the word reason, you know what that means, right? If I say reasons, is that the same word or a different word? <laughs> what if I say reasonable? Definitely a different word. What if I say reason all by itself? What if I say this is a bowl? So these bits of meaning may be either bound or free, and they will combine to form the larger meaning. You can transform words, and we'll see how. Uh, important that becomes to our, uh, our communication. Um, now consider the word replaces. How many morphemes can you find in replaces? Re, place, z, right? All right, and the main word is place. And what comes next is re to make replace. And then you add the, the S to make it um, third person singular. All right. What does place mean? Put. What does re mean? Mm -hmm. Again. Does it? I'm going to place my glasses on the table. Now I'm going to replace my glasses. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I think I'm going to place my glasses on the table, and I'm going to replace my glasses with a pen. So the more things you think you know may or may not be what you know. Isn't this fun? <laughs> um, compositionality. Is the meaning of something or other the sum of its parts? On the word level, we can think of compound words like dog house. It's a house for a dog. Compositional works just fine. How about scarecrow? Is it compositional? Kind of, because it isn't the kind of crow. It's an object that does things to crows, ideally. Uh, how about skinhead? It's not about skin, and it's not a kind of head. It's something else entirely. Okay? So that's on the word level. On the sentence level, for compositionality, uh, she kicked the soccer ball. We understand this is compositional. She kicked the bucket. <laughs> it does not have to do with moving a container with your foot. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we've got speech acts. Speech
Speech Act is something that is accomplished by speaking. Reading, leave taking, inviting, giving information, requesting information, the list is somewhat endless. Many of these things you can also do without the Speech Act. For example, I can say hello or sup. Um, I can also just wave, right? I can apologize, and I'll show you the Speech Act of, uh, of that in a minute, but if I'm in a car and I've done, done something idiotic, I can apologize for having done something idiotic while driving. Show me that you know what that is. No. <laughs> <laughs> won't go into the other gestures that <laughs> like one thing, but it can be something else entirely. I mentioned requesting information as a kind of speech act. Here is a request for information. Is that what you're wearing to school today? <laughs> if you interpret this as a request for information, your day is off to a bad start. <laughs> it is instead the illocutionary force of that utterance is something different from a request for information. Okay. So to show you how gloriously complicated that is, I want to show you how um, fancy linguists can get in analyzing. Here's a model of the Speech Act of apology. Pretend you just did something bad and apologize for it to your neighbor. Yes. Example is the use of the passive voice. 
You have been told probably at some point in your life never to use the passive voice. That's not a good idea. That's not a good piece of advice. If you are writing up a lab report for science, for example, it completely does not matter who did the procedure. What matters is the result, hence you're putting the focus on the result rather than the agent who did this thing. Agents' passives are used in a rather more nefarious way, however. <laughs> Mistakes were made. I, when I hear that, have to make a guess of uh, who exactly was to make that mistake. Uh, but we're, we're shaking that person um, from blame. It used to be that um, there was more of a consensus, well, there is now a consensus that it's probably not a good idea to hit children. But when I first started teaching intro to linguistics, a lot of people thought that, yes, spanking is perfectly good, and children should be spanked if they're going to um, be expected to learn how to be. Um, If you are finding yourself in agreement with the idea that children should be spanked, just like that is, completely bare, think about it. You probably mean they should be spanked by their parents or people who love them and are responsible for their care and nurture. You probably do not think that children should be spanked by random strangers. But if you agree, yes, children should be spanked, without stating more about who's going to do this, you're opening yourself up to a place you don't want to be. Um, yeah, Lakoff, um, back to Lakoff, the don't think of an elephant guy. Um, he's talked about phrases that are used in public discourse where people can be talking and talking but not getting anywhere because they mean very different things by what they're saying. I don't know what kind of a monster would be against family values, that phrase just all by itself. But if you start defining, if you start thinking, which family, the configuration of which family, which values, you'll find that you might not have as much common ground as you thought you did when you're having a discussion about the importance of honoring family values. And that's just the way language works. It's not because anybody is being bad. One person's freedom fighter is another's terrorist. Definition of terms is so good. And certain morphological processes change focus, and that's what they're put on to do. And we went from reason to reasons to reasonable, right? OK, um, here, again, I'm not making a political statement, but I am identifying how this works. I have this icon here to represent a person of any um, age, nationality, gender, um, condition, and so forth, whom I will call Lee. It's a pretty generic name. Lee does not have a house to live in. This is one fact about Lee, along with the fact that Lee can play the harmonica exceedingly well. <laughs> We can change the morphology to get Lee is homeless. What we've done at that point is to add a qualifying adjective to Lee so that the harmonica isn't the point. The point about Lee is the, the fact of our home. Turns out that Lee and a whole lot of other people don't have houses and they are homeless. The next step in this morphological transformation is the homeless as an aggregate group. This is a perfectly okay thing to do. We talk about the French, and so on and so forth. So I have not done anything bad with my language. But you'll notice the absence of Lee at this point. And there is a further change that goes from the homeless to homelessness, which is invariably followed in a sentence by homelessness is a terrible, terrible problem which it is. But realize, if you realize that you've just taken Lee and these people like Lee out of the picture, you may not be approaching the terrible problem with as much subtlety or as much um, 
intentionality as you thought you were. So this is just the way language works. And it's as it should be. Language is good. Um, this is as it should be, so long as we are aware of what is going on. So long as when you know what the passive voice does, your ears kind of twitch when you hear somebody using the passive <coughs> voice without an agent. You check in to make better attention to make sure that you've got the whole meaning of that. <laughs> Otherwise, we may find ourselves having assented to things we do not actually believe or want. The old stories are full of people who negotiated with entities that they did not fully understand and wound up in circumstances that they had not wanted or bargained for. So be watchful, be vigilant. Language is not your adversary, but there's stuff that can be done there. Pause for one or two questions or comments that are very brief, or not. <laughs> very brief, not. <laughs> okay, are you going to go on for um, the part about languages matter? All right. All right. In this context, I'm going to bring up, of course, double. <coughs> You've probably heard the story about the Tower of Babel. Um, take one minute and tell each other that story. <laughs> Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. 
the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the Mormons had built. And the Lord said, look, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there, so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, it was called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. You'll notice the absence of the word curse. God didn't smote anybody. <laughs> God did something to get the attention of people and change the situation. Okay? So when I was the mother of three energetic sons, I relied rather heavily on particular questions. And maybe the most effective question was, hmm, I see. So what happened just before that? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that usually led the conversation in different places. Um, so what happened just before the story about Babel? What's the previous narrative, anybody? What's in chapter nine? And so there was the flood that destroyed everything and took away the curse over the land that had been there. Um, the land was baptized, it's all reset. And God gave a commandment which was to do what? And build the earth. So if everybody's gathered into one place in order to make a tower, they're not doing the fill the earth thing. When you've got little children, instead of spanking them, you can redirect. Redirect. <laughs> okay. And here is a thing that is not in the Bible but that I think because of my life experience. I don't think that the tower was built by volunteer labor. I think that it was the idea of some people within that city, not everybody, to be building that tower. I think that it's very likely that more than one language was spoken there in many literal and non-literal senses. But the only language that mattered, the language of power, was the language of the guys with the clipboards who were telling everybody else what to do. And the people who were not speaking the language of power, either because they didn't know it, or I don't know, for whatever reason, if you're not speaking the language of power, and that is the situation you can be forced to do whatever you don't want to do, you can speak all you want to, or you can, as my Scottish grandmother would say, spare your breath to cool your broth. <laughs> and it doesn't matter at all. What happened with the confusion of tongues was that people realized, oh, we're not all speaking the same language. We do not need to be all under this single discourse. We can have other ideas about things. It's all right. So the hegemony was broken at that point, and far from being a curse, it is a blessing, and I don't say that just because I'm a linguist. Okay. Um, so here's a picture I like a lot. Everybody's busy on the tower, but at a certain point, they're just going to abandon this because it is a vain effort. Um, you're never going to build a tower that reaches the heavens. And if you wanted to do that, why in the world would you come down from Mount Ararat and go up into the plains of China? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly that story. <laughs> okay. So, we come to a notion at this point of language.
language and power. Language is extremely powerful. Conquerors do not learn the language of the vanquished, except for a few commands. There can be um, people who are going back and forth between languages, they're translators, and I can think of two very good examples of just how dangerous a situation that is. Malinche was the Aztec woman who was interpreting between the Aztec government and Cortes. Things did not end well for her. The Iraqi translators who were going between Iraqi Arabic and English were putting themselves in harm's way. And that is just, it's very, very difficult. Um, sometimes conquerors are so powerful they don't want anybody with even the power to be using another language around them because they might be blind. So language suppression happens all over the world. And a prime um, method for doing that is boarding school, where tribal children need to go and speak only the language of the conqueror and in some cases be punished for speaking their own language until that language is extinguished. Linguicide is not good. All of the languages of the world are languages that we need. We need to protect, we need to preserve them, not just by writing down a list of words. So what have we got as a situation when people are typically monolingual rather than bilingual, trilingual, and so forth. Um, monolingualism is either a token of privilege or of abject oppression. If you can go through your daily life of every day speaking only the language that you grew up speaking, and even as more extreme, only the dialect of the language that you grew up speaking, as opposed to the same language but with different socioeconomic markers and so forth. You are in a position of privilege and power compared to somebody who can't do that. If you did not grow up speaking in the language of power, you can learn other languages and negotiate things that way, and it's probably a good idea. If you grew up speaking a language other than the language of power and did not have the chance to learn the language of power, you're in a bad way. So this is why I'm luring all of you people in here. I was saying that monolingualism is a disabling condition, whether we realize it or not. Um, privilege is not always how it's cracked up to be. <laughs> yes, only an SPU with references like this be. Um, so I do suggest taking it seriously that um, other languages are to be sought after and to be learned if it is at all possible for you in aid of reconciliation. This is a topic that we talk about a lot at SPU. Um, reconciliation is not possible without dealing with people on their own terms. And if you don't know the terms that people are using, how are you going to deal with them on those terms? So what the situation devolves into is um, Everybody's wearing earmuffs and using megaphones. This is the cover page of the vintage parenting book. It says, get out of my life. The first thing you drive me in Charleston Mall. Um, so, you know, wearing the earmuffs, can't hear. Wearing the megaphone, I'm shouting everything. Uh, this is not a really good model of communication. So to get rid of the earmuffs and the megaphones in this metaphorical sense, try learning another language, which you can do in many, many different ways. You can take a course, 
you can spend a lot of time, you can just listen, listen, listen. Lots of ways of accomplishing this. It doesn't always work this way, but it can be a very good spiritual exercise. Uh, the etymological meaning of infant is when we can't talk. So you are stripping yourself of the adult prestige, the adult privilege, your ability to express yourself as the person of power that you really are inside. I start thinking of the um, And um, whatever means you take, ideally it's not going to be one of those courses that is teaching you how to instantly get your perceived needs met. Um, and get the lowest possible price for those additional goods. <laughs> um, yeah, if you do that, it's a good idea. And it's not hard, and it's really fun. <laughs> so, Pentecost. Favorite church holiday of linguists. <laughs> <laughs> If Babel had been a curse, and it was not a good thing to have confused tongues and all of these languages, this would have gone down very differently. In the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, shades of Babel. No, not the same motivation. They were in the same place because of their fear of um, being seen as an ally of a political politically dangerous person. Suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, um, Pentecost experiences are not commonly available to anybody who asks. We have to do it the hard way. The, um, the gate of Eden is closed to that, that quick and easy thing unless there is a miracle. But all of these people did not all suddenly start speaking Biblical Hebrew. Instead, the crowd was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. So this is affirmed. And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others stared and said, they are filled with new wine. Being filled with new wine does not help you speak other languages. <laughs> <laughs> but this turns out to be um, an important key of going into the language of the other and um, participating in that unraveling of the sad effects of the fall. So we don't have at Pentecost earmuffs and megaphones, just the Holy Spirit speaking through the mouths of the, of the believers into the ears of willing listeners. Pentecost was one off, um, but we can learn other languages than we do. And um, there's this nice passage in 1 Corinthians as well. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you were eager for the manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. to the extent possible, we should pay attention to language. 
we should respect it and give it reverence as an outward and visible, well, audible sign of inward and spiritual grace. It can be. We need to use language with intentionality. We need to discern the intentions of the speakers that we listen to. And so I've got this nifty graphic of the Isaiah passage. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. May we recycle our earmuffs into baby gloves <laughs> and our megaphones into hearing aids. Hi, my name is uh, Mike Langford. I'm the uh, faculty advisor for IZ, which really means actually very, very little. Uh, <laughs> uh, the vast majority of the work is uh, done by the officers of IV and by uh, Nikki. I don't see she uh, left. But it is to them, really, that we owe our thanks. So maybe we can thank them. And thank you to you too, Dr. Bartholomew, for your years of service. Uh, yeah to the school, um, to students, to faculty, to staff. off with a benediction. A benediction, um, uh, for those who don't know, is actually it's not a prayer. It means good word. Um, and so uh, uh, when I uh, receive a benediction at church, um, I like to keep my eyes open. Some of us maybe tend to close our eyes during prayers. Um, but I like to keep my eyes open so that I can look around and, and remember the things that God has given me um, that surround us. So uh, if you could, maybe you could rise from the benediction. Now receive God's good word, God's blessings. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to give you peace, both now and forever.